Allianz Life Insurance Company of North America has been keeping its promises since 1896 by helping Americans achieve their retirement income and protection goals. As an industry leader in risk management, Allianz has committed dedicated resources and invested in helping independent advisors integrate risk management solutions, including annuities, as part of a comprehensive wealth management practice. For more information, visit www.allianzlife.com slash RIA. Welcome to The Healthy Advisor, a podcast from wealthmanagement.com focused on advisors' personal well-being and healing. I'm Diana Britton, Managing Editor of wealthmanagement.com, and in this podcast, we explore some of the struggles and personal development issues facing advisors and financial services professionals and how to get to a place of healing for mind, body, and spirit. Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of the Healthy Advisor podcast, and thanks for joining us. As you may know, this is the podcast focused on financial advisor health and wellness, and today's guest is going to talk about a health scare he had a few years ago and how that has impacted his his life since Um, He's an advisor. His name is Robert Steinberg. He's the founder and CEO of Blue Chip Partners, an advisory firm in Farmington Hills, Michigan. Robert, thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Diana. And thank you for having me on the podcast. Yeah. So a little more than six years ago, Robert started living a healthier lifestyle, uh, working out a lot more in an effort to lose weight with his daughter, But one day while working out, he had a widowmaker heart attack, which happens when you have a blockage in the biggest artery in your heart. The name of it, you know, leaves certainly no question about the severity of it. It's only 12% of people suffering from the widowmaker heart attack outside the hospital survive, according to the American Heart Association. And so, Robert, we're very fortunate to have you here with us. Um, Take us back to the day that you had your heart attack. Uh, What happened that day? Yeah, I was uh, a uh, kind of a very regular, and still am, but was a very regular exerciser. And I would go to a morning kettlebell class. It was the uh, 6.30 a.m. kettlebell class. And uh, and so what you would do is you you do various exercises. And it was about halfway through the class. You know, I just remember it at about seven o'clock and we would do what are called burpees, which I used to always joke when we would be doing those that those could kill you. But, you know, if, if someone's not familiar with burpee, you kind of almost go to a catcher stance and then you kick your feet out like you're going to do a push up, bring your feet back in and jump up and did a you know a series of, of those. And when I finished doing the burpees, as I'm standing there, our next rotation was to go do chin ups or pull ups. And, and I my breath was, uh, I couldn't, I was having trouble catching my breath, which wasn't abnormal after doing a bunch of burpees, but it, it just didn't get better. And so I kind of rotated over the line to get into our next exercise. There's probably about eight people in the class. And, and when there's about two people in front of me, I just could sense that something wasn't right. And there was a part of me that was thinking, oh, I'll just fight through, uh, and, you know, can't be anything too wrong. And then one more person went, there's one more person in line in front of me. And I, and I just, stepped back and I told the trainer, I said, something's not right. I said, I'm having trouble catching my breath. And so he said, well, why don't you go, you know, take a step outside for a second. So I stepped outside, didn't really get better, came back inside. And, uh, and then before you know it, he said, well, why don't you, uh, you know, sit down and then, you know, really wasn't getting better before you know it, you're laying down, you know, on the mat and, uh, you know, you're, you're feeling, you know, was actually before I laid down on the mat, all of a sudden I felt a tingling in my left arm and, and all of a sudden, you know, that's, mm. you always hear about that as a kind of a telltale sign of a heart attack. And so then eventually, you know, laid down and, uh, and uh, he said, I, I think I should call 911. And I, I said, I was just going to tell you the same thing. So they called 911 and, and while we we're waiting, they got out the defibrillator and they, you know, I've never been trained on one. I've been trained since, and we've had our office trained, but they, they connected it to me. And, and there's a countdown process if somebody has not been trained. And it's like, I remember sitting there having this on my chest and it's three, two, one, and it says no shock required. And there's a part of me saying, oh, I think that's a good thing. And mm. then, you know, eventually the EMS 
arrived, they came in and they were much more aggressive. They kind of just cut my my shirt that I had on in half and uh, and I guess did like a, an EKG when when I was laying on the ground and I never lost consciousness. And, you know, I could feel my heart be somewhat tightened. And all of a sudden, once they did that EKG, I literally saw the eyes of one of the technicians go big and he went right to his phone calling the hospital and then they ended up uh you know quickly you know transporting me to the hospital and right as they're kind of putting me on this on the the stretcher there was uh somebody that was from the earlier class that knew my business partner dan cedar uh, and i asked him to call dan and say let him know what's happening so dan could call my wife and mm. so so from there you know ended up you know getting you know getting to the hospital and when you when you remember recalling waiting you know, to go in for, for treatment. I was fortunate because the hospital was only about 10 minutes from the exercise facility. They ended up, I was able to get in and they did a heart catheterization where if nobody's ever had one. It's, it's a little bit different because they don't knock you out. You stay, you're partially conscious and they go through your wrist and they were ended up being able to clear the blockage. And uh, I'm here to be one of the living statistics to talk about it. So, you know, very, very thankful, you know, couple couple you know kind of sidelights that were interesting that my partner had been called and so he actually called my wife but beat my wife to the hospital and as you know he was there he was trying to get some information and they're asking about religious denomination and various information he was convinced that I had passed away based on the type of questions they were asking mm -hmm. and so it was it was very traumatic for him too and my wife came and and so so thankfully uh was in the right place at the right time and was uh, you know, able to survive. Yeah, and got to the hospital quick enough. I remember you telling me that you felt like it didn't hurt as much as you thought it would. Yeah, it was, it was interesting because I mean, now I'm kind of dating myself, but there was a comedian, Richard Pryor, that would do a skit on when he had had a heart attack and he would go through the whole thing on stage. But before you know it, he'd be on the ground talking about how somebody was like, turning up and ratcheting up the pain and the pain was his most intense pain that he'd ever thought what ever experienced and from my standpoint you know I could feel tightness in my chest but it never hit that point where you know I felt like the pain was you know unbearable or to the degree so I at a certain point I figured yes I'm having a heart attack but it can't be too bad because it's nowhere near the pain that the comedian you know Richard Pryor described it's kind of kind of ironic that I'm getting my med medical thoughts from a comedian, but that was, uh, that's, that was where I was at at the time. So you're looking for any bit of information. So yes, that was, uh, it was intense. And, and I was kind of surprised to find out the severity of the heart attack based on the, the pain that I had experienced. Yeah. Um, and so I know that you were sort of, um, you know, living a healthier lifestyle uh, leading up to the heart attack. And I guess I, I thought that that would have had an, an opposite effect, you know, um, and uh, so did the doctors ever explain what caused it? Yeah, what they, because I ended up having 99% blockage in the Widowmaker that left anterior descending artery, but they said there's no way I could have been actually doing that type of exercise because I was, you know, I probably tend to, to overdo things when I get into doing them. And I, you know, over that last year, I'd be at the gym and I'd always be, uh, you know, trying to improve what I'd done before. So I do an hour on the elliptical and then I might do an hour on the treadmill. So I was, you know, you know, all of a sudden I'd be that guy that was, you know, walking, I never ran on a treadmill, but I might be walking at five miles an hour. I, I guess if you're in the gym, you'd be looking and say, this guy's going to have a heart attack, but I, you know, I always push myself, but what they figured happened at the exercise class is some, you know, some type of, uh, you know, broke off and that is what created the 99% blockage mm -hmm. that there was a little bit of a piece of, I don't know what it's called, plaque or whatever that broke off and that caused the the blockage to, to become so, so extreme so quickly. Um, but yeah, I had, uh, you know, it was kind of the opposite. And when we were going through some of the information, you know, afterwards, you know, it was kind of like I had been doing everything that they would recommend that you would do, you know, in the year leading up to my heart attack. So you're right. It was, it was strange. Hmm. Yeah. Um, and how did you, how did you sort of change your lifestyle afterwards? Um, you know, did you eat differently and exercise differently? Did you go into a recovery program? Yeah, it, it was interesting. So I really didn't change my diet. You know, part of 
the, the motivation or the help in me losing the weight. I had a, my daughter at the time was also, you know, focusing on losing weight and she was eating paleo. So we were eating, you know, extraordinarily healthy and they had, uh, you know, they had sh shared, the doctors had shared one other thing that I didn't touch on that, you know, because I, my heart was in such good shape from the exercise, that is likely what enabled me to, you know, fight through the, the fact that the Widowmaker was not getting blood. So I feel blessed in a way that I pushed myself, but maybe in a way that's what caused the, caused the heart attack. But once you went through the heart attack and, and you're on your road to recovery, I did something called cardiac, cardiac rehabilitation. And what they do is, you know, they start you on very gradual exercise program, but they have you all hooked up to various monitors just to monitor your progress. And, you know, it was a, a rude awakening for me from somebody that was used to pushing myself to, you know, being constantly told to, to slow down and, and, and do things uh, at a, a much slower rate. I was felt like the youngest person in the cardiac rehab, but it just was a whole different feeling that, that I was used to. Yeah. I mean, I feel like I've been hearing a lot more about young, you know, men, uh, you know, even middle-aged men uh, having heart attacks and, and health problems. Um, how has this whole experience, you know, sort of changed your perspective on life from a personal standpoint? Yeah. I mean, from a personal standpoint, I mean, you, I guess, you know, what one of my favorite sayings has always been, you never know the next card in the deck. So you can go from being extraordinarily help, healthy to all of a sudden, you know, have a, you know, life-threatening illness. So, you know, I'll just really try to, you know, concentrate on, you know, getting, you know, living more each day, fulfill, you know, putting a little bit more effort into enjoying each day and not worrying about things as much, you know, joke that, I, you know, tend to hug people a little bit more than I did. You just quite never know that's going to be the last time you saw them. And, you know, you really appreciate your family and, uh, and friends for, for, uh, for who they are and, uh, and really try to look at the positives and things and, and not focus on the negatives. Mm, yeah. Um, and I know that you were talking about how that changed the way you work with clients. Um, so tell us about how, how has that impacted, you know, your everyday work with, with your clients? And, and it's, it's, it's a great question because what in our business, you know, you know, it, it's always difficult. There's a balancing act because, you know, the more clients spend money and enjoy their money, the, the greater the opportunity in many cases that they may not have enough at the end. And I think there's a little bit of a, uh, a, uh, kind of a tendency for, for advisors to kind of, you know, get clients to be a little bit more conservative with some of their spending just to absolutely ensure that there's going to be enough at the end of the road. And after you go through an event like myself, you know, I think we're a little bit more helping clients, you know, make sure that they, uh, you know, as we would say, get the most life out of their wealth. So we encourage people to, you know, to spend more recognizing that what we run into oftentimes is once clients hit a little bit over 80 years old, you know, their spending tends to, to drop, you know, rather significantly. So one of the big changes are, you know, it's always a balancing act when a client says, can I afford to do this? Can I afford to do that? But, you know, you kind of really try to look at it, you know, much, much more closely and really try to encourage them to enjoy life. Uh, the way I always tell clients is, you know, most cases your children are going to get the money anyway. So why don't you, you know, spend a little bit more and enjoy, take them on this cruise, take them on this vacation or help them out in some way. Um, you might as well enjoy that satisfaction because eventually they're going to end up, you know, the recipient anyway. So just really encouraging clients it helped me more realize that, you know, you got to help clients, you know, live for today as much as, you know, save for the future. Yeah. And I mean, it seems like you've done a little bit more of that, right? Since uh, the heart attack oh, yourself. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it's like I say, you know, life is a balancing act. You can, you know, so from, from my personal standpoint, you know, try to stay as active as I can, but but also, you know, take trips, do different things and uh, enjoy, enjoy some of the fruits of what you've uh, um, earned over the years. But at the same time, it's just always that balancing act. But, but really, you know, we took family trips to Greece. I mean, we're I'm actually down in Florida right now with my family, you know, just, just different things that you can do to balance and, you know, enjoy life. Yeah, that's great. I feel like I need to do more of that um, myself. Um, 
So I know, you know, a lot of folks in your situation would probably slow things down work-wise after an event like that. But, you know, you, you've grown your firm from about $300 million when you had the heart attack to $1.1 billion now. Um, you know, I'm sure it fluctuates with, with the markets every day. But, um, you know, why do you think, what do you think really accelerated your firm's growth after the heart attack? And, and it was kind of funny. Um, you know, we, we had, I had a partner, you know, still have the same partner. He's a great partner, Dan Cedar. But we were... Um, at the stage where we were that, that, that practices go through, it's like we needed, we were kind of maxed out on the number of clients that we could handle. So we were right at, right before my heart attack in the process of adding an additional advisor, um, Matt Mondu is an outstanding advisor. We added him to the organization. And at the same time, I was running, doing most of the COO part of the operation. And Matt had a gentleman that he had worked with, Scott Perrette, and he had um, said that you know he might be uh, open to making a switch, and and so at the same time, right as I was about to have my heart attack, we had hired an advisor, and then also added a COO to the organization. And it was from Scott's perspective that the COO was kind of very stressful. So he had already given his notice that he was leaving his current job when I had a heart attack, but he had not started yet. So mm. part of part of what you know, it was kind of a stressful time for, you know, a lot of different people involved. So from that standpoint, we had just started to take the steps to to move the firm to the next level and, and just continue to involve by having a COO that enabled, you know, our, you know, myself and partners to look, focus a little bit more on, on building the business. And from, a, you know, that, what that was really probably the primary driver was just kind of timing of, of, you know, starting to build out the organization. Yeah, I I know that uh, you know your your staff and folks in your office have have said that you there, there's sort of a, a a difference in the office environment, and I'm sure that that's helped um, you know with the growth as well. Um, I mean, talk a little bit about that and how you uh, you know I mean maybe it didn't shift how you treat your staff entirely, but um, you know what's the office environment like now? Yeah, you know, we've we've just been you know a growing firm. I'm trying to think when I had my heart attack, we might have been maybe seven or eight, and now we're up to twenty five employees. Um, you know, something you know we've always been a, a what I'd call you know a work hard you know, but at the same time have fun you know kind of appreciate the little things with our office. You know, we're up to twenty five now, and still have not had a an employee leave our firm and go to a competitor locally. So. We really just try to make sure that, you know, that we're, you know, treating our clients, you know, well, but also treating our employees well, treating them well financially and just doing the little things to appreciate, you know, what they bring to the table. Because at the end of the day, you know, you're not going to have happy clients unless you have happy employees. And it's so, so, so stressful to hire, so stressful to train. So if you can get good people, identify good people and keep them, I think that is the lifeblood of a financial planning practice. And we've been fortunate enough to be able to do that. Yeah, I think that retention level is, you know, speaks volumes um, because that is uh, just number one, not number one, maybe, but a top challenge for um, financial advisory firms. Um can you talk a little bit about the, did you have a succession plan in place before the heart attack with your partner, uh, Dan, and, you know, sort of what challenges have you come up against with the uh, succession plan? Yeah, that, that has probably been, you know, the, the, the real, real significant regret that, that I have and how we approach things. So we had gone through the process and, you know, you know, documented the succession plan, got everything in place, figured out terms and everything, but hadn't followed through on, you know, getting the life insurance, which can be a lifeblood of a succession plan. And so the challenges we face now, Dan is insurable, but I am not. So it does create a little bit of a tension between, uh, you know, how something can work. So, so I guess one bit of advice I'd say, you know, if you're involved in that partnership with, with other advisors, get your succession plan complete, but also make sure that you you know, get the life insurance in place because, you know, thankfully our businesses have continu continued to appreciate and value and now are, are pretty big numbers. And, you know, it, it creates issues when one partner has life insurance, but the other is not insurable. So that would be definitely something in retrospect, wish we would have hopped on that a little bit 
sooner. I mean, I was kind of in that process of losing weight and exercising. So there was a little part of me that was saying, okay, let me get exactly where I want to be. So then I'll apply for insurance and I'll get a better rate. But unfortunately, mm -hmm. uh, you know, sometimes the world doesn't cooperate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a, a little bit of a cautionary tale for, for other folks to, you know, get, get their secession plans in place, um, you know, sooner rather than later. Uh, you know, I know I wanted to shift a little bit. Um, you know, I know you mentioned that uh, your own father, you know, passed away when you were very young um, of a heart attack, actually. And how did that sort of impact you and, and your outlook on life? Yeah, that, that, that's, that's, that's a tougher question. I mean, I think, I, I mean, I, I don't think I was about four and a half when my father passed away. And, you know, I really only have a couple memories of mm -hmm. him, you know, one, you know, I was at some swim club. And I remember, you know, he was talking to somebody, and I went all the way around the pool on the outside, which in retrospect, you know, probably, <laughs> he probably missed uh, watching me. And another was my, uh, you know, he didn't want to give me a shot, even though he was a doctor, and my mom ended up giving me a shot. But, you know, from that standpoint, it just really makes you, you know, appreciate, you know, family that much more. I was fortunate in that my mom remarried and a person who I always referred to as my second dad. It was kind of funny. People look at me funny. I said my first dad, my second dad. But it, mm. you know, it went from four and a half years old to fourth grade without having, you know, a father. And it's it's just difficult for, you know, a younger boy growing up. You know, you don't necessarily know exactly what is different, but there's definitely something different. I was fortunate to have a mom that was all in and, and actually my dad had been a doctor and at least had done some planning. So financially the household was in, you know, in, in good shape. So we're, we're fortunate there, but, you know, it's just, it's just different. And even though, you know, my, my, my second dad was a great person, everything, you always wonder, well, you know, how would my life have been different if my first father didn't pass away? So there's, there's just a little bit of that when I started to get, because he died at 35, it was a terrible story where uh, literally he was a doctor and and my mom was at the hospital and uh, he ended up actually dying on my mom's birthday. But even worse than that, oh, that he was in, uh, you know, a doctor came out in tears after trying to save my father, not knowing who my mom was and went mm -hmm. on and telling her that, that uh, you know that this doctor just passed and he has two young boys and such a great man oh, and gosh. that's how she found out on her birthday that her husband passed away so so from that standpoint that was kind of traumatic from her end but you know from my end you know it's kind of you know what you know but you know I just feel fortunate that my mom was able to find you know another gentleman uh, John Melinda who was just a great man and uh, you know you know really stepped in and he had never been married hadn't had children so it just worked out extraordinarily mm. well felt felt blessed but it's you know there's just a part of you that wonders well how would this how would my life have been different if he hadn't passed away yeah and um your uh your stepfather i guess or your second father mm -hmm. as, as you call him he really brought you got you interested in golf right which is a a, a big passion of yours yeah, he he was a he was a golf pro, and one of my favorite stories of of youth that he was he was a good golfer. He uh, played on the PGA Tour for a little while, but he actually got to play in the uh, in the the National PGA in 1972 at Oakland Hills. So here, you know, I'm nine years old and get to follow him around on the golf course, and uh, mm -hmm. I'm in the uh, and uh, we get to go into like where the pros eat lunch, and it, literally at the next table is Arnold Palmer, and I'm nine years wow. old. And I remember saying, asking my dad, can I get his autograph? Can I get his autograph? And my dad said, no, you can't bother him in here. You can't bother him in here. And so I'm like, <laughs> okay. And then Arnold Palmer gets up to leave. And I tell my dad, I have to go to the bathroom. And as soon as he's outside the door, I'm like, Mr. Palmer, can I have your autograph? And in, in classic Arnold Palmer, he signs it and starts to tell me what a great golfer my dad is, who I doubt that he even knows, but it was classic. And my dad's line used to be that, yeah, I knew at nine years old, the kid was going to be an attorney. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> That was a prior career before financial advisor started as a CPA, then practiced as an attorney, and then, you know, 20, 29 wow. years ago, started as a financial advisor. So kind of. Wow, he called it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's awesome. That's a great story. Uh, I mean, you know, Robert, I, I know I met you at, at the Market Council Summit um, a couple months ago, and you really just struck me as just a really positive person, you know, and um, I'm sure all, all the folks that know you uh, would agree, you just have a positive attitude. Where do you think that comes from? I mean, I've always had it, but I think, you know, 
you know, partially the heart attack, just partially everything, you know, there's a little bit about you that realizes, you know, just enjoy the day. I, I have always, you know, I have a sense of humor, always kind of looking at a way to make people feel comfortable, make them laugh. And it's, it's just something I enjoy. I enjoy interacting with people. Uh, you know, uh, I, I joke that I don't think I've ever met a stranger. You know, I'm the kind of person that just interacts with with all different people and, and feel like there's always something to learn from individuals and just enjoy learning about people's story. And it's, you know, you know, I guess just appreciate life every day and, and uh, hope to be around for a long time. But when you've had serious health events, I mean, you, you just think about it on occasion uh, a little bit more than most. Yeah. Um, well, I'm, I'm afraid we're just about out of time. Um, this was a just a, such a wonderful conversation, and I'd like to thank my guest Robert Steinberg for being on the podcast and opening up, up about his uh, his journey, his life. Uh, thank you so much, Robert. Yeah, thank you for having me, Diana. If you'd like to reach out to Robert, if you have any questions, you can email him at rsteinberg at bluechippartners.com. If you have a struggle yourself, if you wish to share your experiences and help others in similar situations, please feel free to reach out to me at diana.britton at informa.com. I'd like to thank you for listening to The Healthy Advisor. If you've not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This is Diana Britton reminding you that where there's healing, there is hope. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to The Healthy Advisor, a podcast focused on advisors' personal well-being and healing. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of wealthmanagement.com. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional advice. Always seek the advice of your healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding your particular situation. Allianz Life Insurance Company of North America has been keeping its promises since 1896 by helping Americans achieve their retirement income and protection goals. As an industry leader in risk management, Allianz has committed dedicated resources and invested in helping independent advisors integrate risk management solutions, including annuities, as part of a comprehensive wealth management practice. For more information, visit www.allianzlife.com RIA.